is the main focus of the meeting, um, which I'm going to let David take the lead ro role with. Thanks, Joel. So at our last meeting, we discussed things that have been working for the group, um, where the group would like to go in the future. And one of the things that rose to prominence was the idea of reviewing the various options from a municipal standpoint for uh, controlling development in the places where the town um, is not prioritizing increased development. And so for today's discussion, I put together a, a brief review of a long list of options. Um, so this is not going to fully describe everything about any of these options. Um, it's a, an introduction to the palette and um, we'll have a chance for discussion of um, additional pluses and minuses of those options um, and hopefully some thoughts about which ones we should continue considering, what we'd like to learn more about, um, some guidance for uh, the committees to work from this palette um, and maybe add to it uh, to, to continue that, that conversation moving forward with what kinds of um, land use regulations and tools you can apply to controlling development in the town. Do you want to uh to entertain questions as we go along or do you want to save them to the end? I think as we go along is fine. Um, I, I have some some guiding conversation planned afterwards, um, but I think chiming in along the way, um, as long as we can keep on track is fine. And, and maybe I'll uh, rescind that as we go along if it seems like we're <laughs> yes. running long. But um, I think this is a complicated conversation and, and one that would benefit from people um, not sitting too long wondering if they have a, a serious question. All right. Will there be a document that we can um, like either have or have sent to us or I'm just trying to think whether I should be taking notes or paying attention. I'd be happy to share share this list. Um, I also, uh, in the email invite to this meeting, um, there's the list of tools and also some additional links to learn more about some of those tools. Um, and actually, uh, maybe, I, maybe David, if I, this is Alyssa, if I could briefly interrupt, I think I yeah. don't have emails for three, um, people here. So Jamie, I don't think I have yours or John Jensen or David Parks. If you guys want to type your email in um, to the chat box, you can do it to me or to everyone, then I can um, add you to the list also. Thank you. I think that, that method of sharing works better. So can you all see a full screen of the slide? Mm -hmm. Great. Somebody's computer is loud. Uh, so we're going to start with a warning, um, because I know that some of this thing, stuff is controversial. Um, so this is a presentation that briefly describes the set of tools available that the town can consider. No one's proposing that we use any one of these. No one is proposing that any one of these is applied to a specific parcel. Some people might find some of these tools to be totally inappropriate or unacceptable in some locations, all locations. We're here to study the variety of options um, so, and decide if any of these options should be studied further by this group. So just wanna make sure that that's something everyone's aware of. I'm not saying that we should definitely do any of these things in any particular location. It's a, a set of tools. So with that, I think everyone can relax, enjoy kittens if you like kittens, puppies if you like puppies, take a minute to smile. Um, and then we can get to where this all comes from. Um, any changes that the town makes should be in concert with the town's comprehensive plan. Um, and so I paraphrased a bit the vision statement of the comprehensive plan just to keep everyone having that in mind. So the vision statement of the comprehensive plan is that the town values and conserves 
rural character, preservation, and the enhancement of the environment. The town is economically viable and socially diverse. The town um, plans for orderly residential growth and carefully planned business and light industrial growth. Um, the town has activities, education, and facilities that promote community and cooperation. Um, and the town has innovative and responsible use of their historic and natural resources. And getting deeper into the comp plan, there's specific calls for designating areas where development should be encouraged and areas where development should be discouraged. Most of what we're talking about today is tools for areas where development should be discouraged, but there's certainly also other areas where it should be encouraged. Um, the plan calls for preventing sprawl by planning for residential development that's consistent with open space conservation. There's a lot of ways to do that. Some of them listed in the comp plan are clustering housing for conservation subdivisions with adjacent protected open space, but that's not the only way. Uh, the comp plan also calls for um, documenting forested and undeveloped acreage with frontage on existing year-round roads and considering ways to protect these areas from urban sprawl. And using modern planning and zoning techniques to preserve the small town rural character that residents desire, as well as to protect unique natural areas and environmental resources. So those are all um, some of the specific aspects of the comp plan that support uh, this kind of thinking. They're not the only goals of the comp plan. Um, and as is common with all comprehensive plans in a diverse community, some of the suggestions and directions of the comp plan conflict with and require compromise with um, other, other sections. So we're focusing on one part of the, the town's overall goals. Um, heading into a consideration of that, I wanted to talk about briefly six things that people hate, change and the way things are, density and sprawl, rising land prices and falling land prices. Everything that we do in planning um, is a trade-off between these things and is a compromise. Um, and it's, it's very easy to um, have strong feelings in, in both directions on every aspect that we consider. So uh, we're gonna review a set of tools um, and think about the pluses and minuses, the trade-offs that come with each one of them. I thought we'd have one more moment, bring the cat and puppy people together. All right, so we're gonna go into this long list. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it relatively short and feel free to jump in with conversation questions about each of these planning strategies. So um, for each strategy, we'll have a, a basic um, introduction to it and a little bit of pluses and minuses. Uh, it's, there's not a lot on each side, so there's definitely room for more conversation. Um, so starting with the simplest to explain and understand method for uh, growth control in places where the town does not want to see a lot of development is large lot zoning. Large lot zoning is setting a large minimum lot size requirement for future subdivisions. So um, commonly in the Northeast, this would mean having a minimum lot size that's between 10 and 30 acres. Um, in other places in Western states, minimum lot sizes in areas that are uh, priority for conservation can be 100 acres, 150 acres. Um, but generally because of the size of parcels and the um, history of development in the Northeast, uh, large lot zoning is generally targeted between 10 and 30 acres. Uh, that's a lot bigger than the town's current two acres. Um, but it's still not really all that large um, in the pieces that you end up with. Um, a, a variant of large lot zoning is large frontage requirements. It's basically the same idea. You preserve um, land or minimize subdivisions by requiring a lot of frontage or space along the road um, for each new lot. So um, some towns like the town of Ulysses has considered uh, requiring 800 feet of frontage for a new lot um, to limit the number of new lots that are created along a road. Uh, large lot zoning for uh, preservation of open space has some benefits. It's really easy to understand 
it's not that complicated. Um, you just have to have really large lots. If you want large lots and you require large lots, uh, you're going to maintain that large lot format um, that has a, a particular rural character and it particularly um, preserves the character along roads. Um, the lot sizes, if they're big enough, um, one reason a lot of municipalities want to keep large lots is because those lots can either be kept in ag or used for ag in the future. Um, places where uh, forestry is an important use, it's also, it's more difficult to farm and it's more difficult to do forestry as lots get broken up into smaller pieces. So maintaining um, land in larger chunks is useful for that as well as for um, habitat protect protection. Uh, the larger lots that you keep, the less fragmentation that you have um, of the ecosystem um, as well as other kind of human productive uses of the land. Uh, there are some concerns that come with large lot zoning. Uh, it can promote an inefficient development pattern. So if you basically just get suburbia with really large lawns, um, that's not very ecologically sensitive of a way to develop. Um, you are still cutting up land. Um, and when the lots required are large, you're more likely to get long driveways and get uh, parcels to be used entirely, um, where you know somebody may just want to cut off two acres to sell a little bit to pay their taxes or um, to cover a cost. If they have to cut off 10 acres at a time instead of two acres at a time, um, that's not a very efficient use of the land, especially if it's just going to be used for residential use one way or another. Um, Question. Go um, ahead, Ted. You've got reduced fragmentation on one side as a good thing, so you want less of it, but you're saying that large lots create fragmentation? It, it's, it goes both ways. You have less fragmentation than if you allowed a whole bunch of small lots. You know, it, compared to the town's current zoning where you have two acre minimums that so you can cut up a whole lot. Um, slightly more complicated because the subdivision requirements um, in the town can balance out to 10 acres or use frontage. But um, if you allow an entire lot to get cut up into lots of small lots, um, that's a lot of fragmentation. But even with large lots, you still have uh, fragmentation of, of the, the, the parent lot. If you consider the existing say 100 acre lot, uh, when so you cut how, it up into... How, how would you eliminate the concern about fragmentation? Uh, go to huge lot zoning? Well, we'll look at some, some other tools where you allow uh, creation of some small lots and protect a, a large contiguous piece. Um, other concerns, uh, similar to what I was just saying about inefficient development pattern, um, you can get really large useless lawns that are not habitat. Uh, especially, this is especially a concern, um, you know, when you start with intentions for uh, large lots, you know, 15, 10 acres, and then in the political process, uh, you end up negotiating down to five acres, seven acres. Um, you can really end up with lots in that, uh, that size that are as they say, too big to mow and too small to farm. So you basically get large lot sprawl. Uh, requiring large lots um, also increases the cost of new housing. It's commonly called exclusionary zoning, where you, you, know, you have to be able to afford to buy 10 acres to be able to um, purchase uh, land and build a new house on it. The next tool we're going to talk about is called use restrictive zoning or restrictive use zoning. See, I flipped it on the next slide. Before you go on to that, David, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment about this increased cost of new housing. Mm -hmm. um, the house that's right up the road from me that just sold, sold for $305,000 with only five acres and the, my mail carrier's house i'm not sure what it, it's actually contracted for it's under contract and it was listed for just under 73 acres in the house 
for just under half a million dollars. So we're already doing that. And I, I don't think, uh, we have a house on Jersey Hill Road that a new house that was built about three or four years ago, the house itself cost a million dollars. So we are already doing that. Nobody wants to build little houses anymore. That's true. And I, th I think that's um, historically been the case. It makes the cost of construction in Tompkins County is between two and $300 per square foot. Um, so even if you're looking at a thousand square foot house going at the cheaper end of the market, just construction can run you $200,000 to build new. Um, it's really expensive to build here for a variety of reasons, um, but the more land you require to go with the house, the more expensive it's gonna be. Um, it's a, it's a, only a piece of the overall cost, but it definitely has an impact. Did, the, did county planning have any figures that worked in, uh, let's call it inflation into that? You know, today's $200,000 house was once 100,000 in numbers that we're used to, us old folks. Oh, <laughs> um, you know, I couldn't tell you what that equates to in say $1950, but um, you could work back. It's definitely gotten more expensive to build housing as requirements have increased for things like energy efficiency. Um, so there, there's additional costs in, in addition to um, the land for sure. And generally land is a small percentage of the cost, but it is a cost. So it definitely has an impact. So use restrictive zoning or restrictive use zoning. Um, this is a kind of zone that you can apply in particular areas that uh, could either allow only very limited housing or no housing. Um, commonly, this is used in places where agriculture is a high priority, um, in an area designated for heavy industry, uh, or in areas where forest production is a high priority. Um, so it's not very common, but it is possible to have zones that don't allow um, or allow with significant restrictions uh, a small number of new houses. So if, if there are areas where that's appropriate, it is possible. Um, the benefit of that it's very efficient at preventing new sprawl residential development where you don't want it. Um, in my opinion, it's always good to be as clear about what you want and what you don't want as possible when writing regulations, if you wanna get that outcome. Um, it can be applied to discrete areas. Um, it's the most straightforward approach. If you don't want residential development, you can not allow it or only allow a very small amount of it. So it's easy to understand what's allowed. Um, there's definitely concerns. Um, one is how this holds up in court. If you apply it to a large area, um, courts have not been very kind to uh, blanket restrictions on building new homes. Uh, single family homes in particular are considered somewhat sacrosanct by courts. Um, they're not considered to have a high impact. Um, there, you need as a town to have really strong and specific reasons for excluding new home construction completely from a specific area. Um, also, it's, it's hard to get political support for something as um, specific as not allowing residential development at all or severely restricting it. The next tool. Can I, can I ask a question about that one? Um, yeah, go ahead. In terms of, uh, I would assume that, uh, could it be something that a landowner, instead of doing like a conservation easement, can they ask, hey, I'd like to do that. I'd like to have my land zoned like this. I'm not sure why they want to do that, but uh, as opposed to forcing a family who's just purchased land to then zone their land against the way they'd like to go do it. It, it is something that, um that could be used as an opt-in uh, type scenario. Um, there, there could be various benefits from that, whether it's a, a legacy type situation where somebody wants to protect land into the future. 
um, or if it's you know uh, a negotiation in as a mitigation for environmental impacts of other development um, that could happen. It's not really all that different from an easement, except for the way that it's enforced. Um, but it, it's a possibility, and I think that's something that the CAC is looking at having some options for overlay forest use or other other zones that would be restrictive about what could be done on a part of the parcel. Thank you. Uh, the next tool is limiting the number of subdivisions. Uh, that is what it, it sounds like. You use a formula uh, or a flat number to determine how many new lots can be created from any existing lot. Um, so one example of that is in the town of Ithaca in their agricultural zone, they have a limit to the number of subdivisions. So as of the date that that law was adopted, um, anyone, any parcel could get one new lot for every seven acres of the existing lot. So if they had a seven acre lot, they could subdivide one lot off of it. If they had a 14 acre lot, they could subdivide two lots. Um, the new lots in this kind of system generally usually have a maximum size. It's usually the smallest that would be allowed by the health department. So around two acres, um, unless they uh, have municipal water, in which case they might allow down to half an acre. Um, and they're frequently also required to cluster those new lots, um, which can, the clustering can be required based on ecological imperatives or farmland protection goals. So um, some uh, places that use zoning like this would require you to cluster um, any new lots that you're allowed to add, um, say off of prime ag soils or away from uh, important ecological features. Um, and as we go through the next several ones of these, you'll see there's a lot of similarities um, and it really comes down to exactly how you want to do things. I might mention that that is uh, theoretically where we are now with our, with our ordinance uh, in that there's a, a five acre uh, density that applies in the low um, density zone. Um, and you're, the number of lots to which you're entitled is based on one for every five acres or in a needlessly complex formula, one for every 200 feet of road frontage, whichever gives you the larger number. Yep. And yeah, 200 feet of road frontage is not a lot compared to five acres. No, and uh, is... and along the existing roads, the, the 200 feet of road frontage is it, it, well entitles you to a lot, and and what we've been getting is is roadside development. Uh, because there's not requirement for five acres on that roadside. It's, it's a, it can be, well, it can be the, the, the minimum that the health department will let you get away with, but you gotta have the 200 feet of frontage. Um, yep. I think, actually there might be a two acre minimum in the, on those, on those, in the low density zone. But that yes. survived from the previous, uh, where the, the whole entire um, town was basically the, 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 the minimum or, or the maximum, you know, I look at it. Um, was two acres instead of five. We down zone from two to five, um, but only behind the road. So it's basically still two acres along the road where it's most at risk. Right, and that's an important consideration. In, in this market, it's very difficult to afford building new roads. Um, so the vast majority of the demand is just for roadside, uh, roadside frontage because it, it's too expensive to uh, to really build much away from the road, um, unless you can get higher housing prices. But um, in, a, in, our, in our current market, that's not very common. Um, so with limiting subdivisions, um, some of the benefits, it's a compromise between preventing and allowing development. You're, you're giving people a specific amount of development that they can do. Um, usually it is, uh, the amount of development that's allowed, the number of lots is kind of benchmarked by the previous rules. So however much you could have developed before, you can still develop that many lots, but they have to be smaller. So you're preserving a piece that's left over. Um, in some cases, um, it, won't be as, it won't be as many lots as were previously allowed, but usually that's, that's the compromise. Um, 
Another benefit is that it allows um, the creation of small lots, which are um, cheaper, they're easier to orient along the road where they don't require long driveways. Um, so you can get some new small lots. Um, so you get high density where you're developing, but low density overall because you're preserving uh, a large contiguous piece of the land at the end of the day. Um, some of the drawbacks or concerns, uh, long-term tracking for this um, from a staff um, position, it can be difficult to make sure that um, when lots are divided and then redivided again 10 years later, um, that you're tracking how those development rights um, are passed forward. And I know that that has been difficult for the town in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not impossible. Um, uh, it, it can also be diffi difficult for the public to understand or difficult for landowners to understand. You know, you buy um, a six acre parcel and it comes with no subdivision rights. Um, and you sell it and then somebody else buys it and then somebody else buys it. Um, at some point, the, the information may not be passed on and it can be difficult for people to understand. People can end up being upset um, when they want to subdivide and aren't able to. Okay. Density averaging, uh, it's, it's a similar setup. Um, so density averaging, um, you set an overall maximum density um, but allow flexibility to achieve that. So you can allow new lots to be any size um, to meet your maximum density. You don't have to set a minimum lot size. You don't have to set a maximum lot size. Uh, if, if the goal for your density averaging was a maximum of one unit per 10 acres, for example, just to keep the numbers simple on a 100 acre parcel, um, someone could develop 10 10 acre parcels. Um, they could develop. Um, oh, I, I got the, you can, we'll skip the middle one because I started working on that and skipped it. Um, mm -hmm. You could develop nine two acre parcels with one 82 acre parcel left over. Basically, anything in between there, you can work it out how you want to. Um, I've uh, seen this be useful where people said, um, we're evaluating something like uh, the previous plan where you would be required for new parcels to have them be as small as possible. And people say, well, in this market, people want an eight acre parcel or they wanna be able to buy a five acre parcel. They don't wanna only uh, have new parcels be the minimum size. Um, with density averaging, you have that flexibility um, in subdivision to figure out uh, what works for what works well for a particular lot and the, the land that it's on. In in both this and the previous tool, um, is it possible? Is it legal, or and is it possible to include uh, as part of the measure the surrounding parcels? In other words, the rights for parcel A depends on its on itself and its neighbors. Um, it, particularly with density averaging, um, that is what's done in the Adirondack Park regulation. So I included that in the email as a link that people can consider. Um, the way the Adirondack Park Agency regulates density um, is based on ownership. So say you owned uh, 300 acre parcels that were um, in the same zone, in the same area, you could do all of the development for the, that those parcels allow you to have in one place, and then you wouldn't be able to do anything on the rest of the land. Um, obviously, that's a long-term tracking uh, concern mm -hmm. of um, maintaining a chain of title for those development rights um, that can be difficult over time, but it, it's certainly something that's possible. It's just a database problem. Um, is, does, how about different owners? Is that, that's where I'm thinking about the legal issue. Yeah, so, so then you're getting really into a transfer of development rights scenario, which is one of the tools we'll talk about farther down the list. At the time that we were doing ours, um, we didn't have the possibility of using conservation easements, but um, make tracking easier, reduce the need for tracking, basically, if, you, if the uh, 
if the pieces, once they're um, have their development rights used up, um, are then protected by easement, the, the the easement itself precludes any further subdivision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know that the town in the past has had um, some concern about, uh, I think the system we currently use is notating on subdivision plats where uh, the development rights go when those subdivisions happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be difficult if it's not also tied with something like a deed restriction or a conservation easement um, that would show up in a title search when someone buys the lot down the line. I, I know that's been a concern in the yep. past. Um, so the benefits of, of density averaging, um, it's flexible. It allows your uh, small lot, medium sized lot, large lot um, creation while maintaining a low overall density. Um, again, it's a compromise between preventing and allowing development. Um, some people are going to be unhappy that allows too much. Some people are going to be unhappy that it doesn't allow enough. Um, it's, it's in between, and it's a, a metric that can be tweaked um, by a political process to figure out what compromise works. Um, it has some long-term tracking uh, difficulties. It can be hard for people in the public to understand, especially after uh, multiple sales. Um, mm -hmm. The next is called sliding scale or area-based allocation zoning. It's very similar to density averaging and number of subdivisions. Um, so with a sliding scale or area-based allocation, um, you can include a density bonus for preserving a larger contiguous tract of land. So maybe in that scenario we were talking about where you had 100 acres and you were aiming for a uh, a one acre, one lot per 10 acre density. Uh, maybe if you preserve one of those lots as 90 acres, you allow more lots to be created on the small piece that's remaining um, to encourage uh, the preservation of a larger contiguous tract. Um, sometimes sliding scale uh, allocation allows a different number of subdivisions for smaller parcels um, than for larger parcels. So the thinking there, um, and I've been in communities that have felt this way, is that once you get a parcel below a certain size, you basically already um, had a significant environmental impact. You know, when you've got a, a seven or eight acre lot, um, you're kind of already getting towards a suburban level of density instead of a rural level of density. Um, and there's kind of less impact to subdividing up what will probably just be a large lawn anyway. So why not make that, um, it may have less impact to make, you know, six acre parcels into three two acre parcels than it would be to make a, a 20 acre parcel into uh, two 10 acre parcels. So it, it's kind of saying, we have some small, some areas with small lots that are already kind of not the large lot rural um, development type that we want. And so we're not as concerned with concentrating additional development where we already have some development. I could, so easily, see how that could, I could easily see how that could be um, like throwing in the towel on, on areas that are already, um, you know, past a certain point in terms of development along the road. Um, because you could use the back acreage to uh, justify, you know, cutting up the frontage even more. That, that's, I, I'm not sure I would describe it as throwing in the towel as much as acknowledging that it's, you know, it's become a suburban um, context. Mm -hmm. And if you can double the density and still have a suburban context there, you're preserving land elsewhere that's not being developed. Certainly not not for everywhere, but particularly in places that have had a lot of um, frontage development on the street, um, where it's it's already become more of a neighborhood than a rural context, it can make sense. Again, this is a compromise between allowing and preventing development. Uh, you can have these small lots 
It encourages increased density where development already exists. You already have impacts of human habitation there. So you're preventing um, using that land instead of using other land where you'd be cutting into um, a virgin habitat is useful. Um, this can still be difficult to track. Um, it can, it's even more difficult than the others for people to understand. Um, and it prevents, uh, presents a certain amount of uncertainty to landowners and how they can subdivide and what that process would be. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is conservation subdivision requirements. Um, so conservation subdivision requirements mandate an, excuse me, an ecological approach to designing the location and layout of clustered residential developments. Um, I, I want to be clear that there is a distinction between clustered housing and conservation subdivisions. Clustering is just putting uh, houses on small lots and having some land left over. A conservation subdivision, you do that, but to get to that point, you start with an evaluation, an ecological evaluation of the site. You start with the areas that should be preserved based on their ecological significance. Um, and that drives the areas that are allowed uh, development in the future. So um, it's, it's not the same as just simple clustering. Uh, clustering alone certainly has some benefits, but requiring a conservation subdivision process has a lot more benefits. Um, if generally, um, all of these metrics are flexible. So how much of the lot you preserve depends on how you set up the rules, um, how much is allowed to be developed and how much is required to be protected. Um, this allows development on a remaining portion of a lot while preserving a large um, segment of it and preserving the segment of it that's most important. Um, frequently, this comes with the incentive of um, some kind of density bonus. You may get a couple extra lots, um, even though they're very small um, for going this way. Lots of municipalities make this optional um, with the, uh, a bonus as an incentive to encourage people to go that way. Um, there are also lots of municipalities that require this. Uh, so it has um, similar benefits to the last few, um, but the added benefit that it's based on site-specific analysis and ecological priorities of the community. Um, also, uh, I didn't mention frequently baked into conservation subdivision requirements um, in that process is considering connections to adjacent parcels so that the preserved open space um, is part of a, a system of um, ecological habitat um, and uh, the, the kind of land system functions um, and not just kind of an island by itself. Um, concerns, um, tracking those development rights in the long term can be difficult to understand. It's a complicated review process uh, both for the developer and for the planning board. Um, it's also difficult to implement this kind of system in a market like Danby, where most development is one lot at a time. Um, in other places, I have seen uh, a requirement to do this kind of planning up front, even if you're just doing a few subdivisions. So um, if someone who had a large lot and wanted to start subdividing off pieces, would need to go through this process um, to kind of plan for the long-term full build out of the maximum density that they'd be allowed, um, even if they're just gonna um, take off one or two pieces at a time. It has to be thought through on the front end, um, which is a good thing in general, but it's also time consuming. It has an expense associated with it um, and you're, you're making decisions uh, ahead of time that you might need to revisit later down the road. I would like to make a comment. It's a Absolutely. story. It's a story, actually. So there, when you go south on South Danby Road and you hit the county line, it becomes a road called Crumb Town Road, which is in mm -hmm. Spencer. And Spencer has no zoning, none. And 
uh, there's a road that comes off of Crumtown Road called Lang Road. And I have to admit that it's probably been 30 years since I was on Lang Road. And I was there the other day. And I have a friend who lives right at the corner of Lang Road and Crumtown Road. And she and these other houses there, the area there is kind of open. It, it was farmed at one time. I think she actually lives in the farmhouse. But there are other more modern buildings, but it was all open. And so these buildings are kind of exposed and they seem close together, even though they probably have five acre plots. And I don't like that at all. And so I turned down Lang Road and went through these first five houses or so that are kind of all open and exposed. And Lang Road used to be absolutely 100% no houses down there beyond those houses, no houses. And it was all treed, all treed, forested in kind of a hilly area. And it was, there was at one time when you got down to the end of Lang Road, it gets into Tallow Hill Road, which is actually part of Danby. And there used to be part of the Danby State Forest there and I would go cross country skiing there. But this time I was driving in my car. Well, what has happened in the past 30 years is with the snow zoning that they have, these houses have come along. And what happened was that instead of somebody coming and clearing five acres you know, claiming, claiming 30 acres and clearing five and making a big open space. Every one of these houses down the road, the only way that you could tell there was a house there was you could see the opening in the trees for the driveway. And you kind of looked down the driveway and you could just vaguely see a house. But all the trees were left. So you had houses that were in there but, and the envelope around the house was really small and all the trees had been preserved. And I didn't mind that. I thought these people have made good choices. If they're gonna build there, they have done a nice job of maintaining the rural character of that road, that part of the road. And I think we could do that in Danby. If these people want to come here and build, then they have to maintain the rural character and, and the house has to play just a very small part to the parcel. It has to blend in. And that's the only way that uh, you're going to be able to preserve wildlife. Because when you start clearing the land and you have my neighbor behind me mows 30 acres. He really does. <laughs> He's out there all week long mowing his 30 acres and it's down to grass. So, you know, you have no wildlife that way. It's interesting that you observed that about Spencer because the, there are parts of Danby that were, that is also the case. Uh, and it's, and it's, the, it's the only reason why in some parts of town is it, it still feels rural despite the development density if you took all the houses that have built, been built back in on long driveways and moved them to the roadside, um, you would have a completely different feel. It's only because people have chosen not to do that that we retain some, some of that rural character, which works a lot better in a forested place than it does in an open field situation. So that's, you, you caught both of those. Um, you know, the, the same number of houses, but you just, it's just a lot harder to hide them in an open field. Right. The the driveways on Lang Road weren't really all that long. I mean, maybe 100 feet. You know, you could see the house back in there in the garage. But it was the, what they had done was instead of saying, well, I'm going to have a big vegetable garden and I'm going to have all these um, non-native plantings around the foundation and all of that sort of thing then they had just done nothing and let it be sort of natural. And it was, 
and and they had built houses that sort of fit into that kind of mm -hmm. setting too. So right. we'll, we'll talk. Well, one of the things on the list is actually talking about a tree preservation ordinance, which is something that um, some places do of requiring the preservation or replacement of trees over a certain size. Um, but it's farther down the list, so we can yeah. definitely get to that. On, on specifically to this point, I, 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 I think it's worth mentioning it. We, this is what we had proposed and in fact enacted, but, but it had a very brief life. <laughs> before um, the, the, uh, the town board rescinded it and, 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 uh, and 10 years later we, we never really got to implement it. But the, I, the thought was that we would um, do exactly this process where um, before any subdivision happened to a property there would have to have been a conference with the planning board and an overall site plan um, consideration where you looked at the conservation values and, and decided where the lots might best go um, that they're entitled to. And then that area where, they're, where they could go would be designated um, as the, the, you know, the subdivision area and, would, and then would go through an a, a, a expedited review from that point forward. But um, it, uh, we just said we didn't really get to implement it. But, that, but it was very much like what you just described, David. Before we before we go any further, just a quick question about um, how long I, the meetings are. I'm not really part of these meetings before, so I have a little one I need to put to sleep at some point. Um, how, is there a time end to this meeting? I, I heard that you're like just partially through the list. I don't know what that means. I just want to get a sense of that. Generally, these meetings, in my experience, have been in, in uh, seven to nine. Okay. About two hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say um, it, we might we might aim for an hour and a half, but, we, but it's not unusual to go to two. Um, it is being recorded, Jamie. So if, if you need to go and you'd like a recording later, we can share that. Another thing I'd like to say is that when we were working with Jason and we started with the sort of water resources and the riparian habitat, part of our approach was we were trying to determine what things in the town we wanted to preserve so that we would make sure that we had a map of everything we wanted to preserve and then people couldn't build there. And mm -hmm. so we, I think Joel would agree that our decision was sort of, we have to understand what we want to preserve before we, we know if we have any space that we would want to give up for houses. Yep. I wouldn't put it quite so, so uh, right. That's my plus and minus, but um. <laughs> well, so I think there's there's somewhat of an organization or overarching theme to this the arch of the tools that I am sharing here is that they kind of start with um, the sledgehammer approach. Um, and then trend toward the more kind of surgical, identifying specifically what you want to preserve and protecting only that. Um, so I, I think it'd be useful to, to move forward um, through these, um, but also noting that, you know, these aren't the only tools available, but also a lot of these tools work together um, and can be combined in different ways um, for different locations and different uses. So with that, I'm going to um, step forward to um, floating or overlay zone. Um, so this one, I think a lot of you will be familiar with. Danby already has um, an overlay zone. It's the aquifer high vulnerability overlay zone. Mm -hmm. So this was an area um, that was determined um, to have aquifers that uh, could be damaged by development. Um, it was mapped over the whole town. Um, there's specific places where additional requirements apply on top of the underlying zoning. So it doesn't matter what zone you're in, if you are also in an aquifer high vulnerability overlay zone, um, there's additional requirements that are triggered by that. 
Um, there are other kinds of overlay zones um, for different kinds of things that you might want to preserve. Um, there, uh, the town of Ithaca has um, overlays of stream buffer requirements. They have two kinds of streams. Um, some uh, larger streams require a 100 foot buffer, smaller streams require a 50 foot buffer. Um, you can also have loading zones that apply based on some other characteristic that you want. So um, you could have a form-based code loading zone or an affordable housing bonus floating zone that someone could opt into if they were willing to build in a certain way. Um, the benefits of having a floating or overlay zone is that it um, ties development restrictions um, or increases to specific features of the land or of the development. It gives um, the town a more flexible approach than applying a blanket zone to 100 acres at a time. Um, the, the concerns or drawbacks are that um, there can be less certainty. It's, it's not as simple as just telling someone, oh, you're in the LDR zone or, oh, you're in the um, high density residential zone. Um, you could have multiple zones on your parcel because uh, at the back of your parcel, there's an aquifer or there's uh, a steep slope or um, an old growth forest, something like that, uh, that you could have an, old, an overlay zone uh, to protect. Um, it's harder to know what restrictions are in place on your parcel. Uh, you can also end up with somewhat complicated interpretations for the planning board or BCA. Um, especially when the overlay zone is created from GIS data that, um, you know, so there hasn't been a surveyor who went out and looked at something. You were relying on data that was developed from an aerial photograph that was 40 years old and they applied an algorithm to it and it spit something out. Um, you, you then need to kind of site verify some of the edges of things like that. And they're not, uh, they're usually not based on uh, surveyed parcel boundaries. They're based on some natural phenomenon or some other requirement. So it just makes things a little more complicated and less uncertain. If you were to base them on parcel boundaries, which wouldn't be best from the point of view of cons conservation, but if you were, wouldn't modern GIS tools make the whole process rather simple to find out what you're in? Sure. At, at that point, I'm not sure there's really much benefit in it being uh, an overlay. Um, if you're just applying it to whole parcels, it's just a different zone. Um, okay, the next section is um, buffer or siting requirements. Um, so this is uh, some of what Rhonda was just talking about. Um, you can, with buffering or siting requirements, um, not change the level of density that you allow um, but require that density to be hidden in some way. Um, you can reduce the visual impacts from the road. Um, it can be useful if you want to protect significant views um, or view shed corridors. Uh, sometimes siting requirements um, might say something like uh, you're not allowed to build um, along a ridge line where you're going to put a cut in the, the kind of contour of the top of the ridge and the trees. Um, you have to site your house where it's going to be out of sight from some um, particular viewing corridor. Um, and these kinds of rules uh, are frequently combined with um, clustering rules or uh, conservation subdivision. They can also um, stand alone. You, know, you can require um, a buffering or, or hiding of new developments um, even with just a standard roadside, um, roadside type development, two acre development. Um, the benefits are that you are reducing visual impacts from the road or to neighbors. Um, you can get the illusion of rural character at suburban densities. Um, exactly. <laughs> the concerns there are you know, when you require deeper setbacks and uh, to hide new housing, you're increasing the environmental impact of that housing. You have more impervious area, longer driveways or new roads required if you're doing uh, multiple subdivisions. Um, that increased environmental impact may be worthwhile if it's more important 
how things look than how they perform. Um, uh, that that can be uh, that's frequently a, a choice that people make. Um, you have some increased development review and costs um, because it's not as simple as saying uh, where something is allowed. You really need to look into um, how the buffering or siting considerations play out on a site by site basis, um, which also gives you less less certainty for the landowner or, or for a developer. Um, it's a it's also kind of more of a negotiated process, um, which is. Uh, great if you like being involved in that, but it, it can open um, the town to um, concerns about lawsuits and favoritism and other things like that. It, it's not as cut and dry as um, just having a specific um, setback and lot size. Is that then something that happens uh, in the context of a planning board uh, interaction with so it, it would be up to how the ordinance was written if, but usually, yeah, you would be requiring site plan review and, you know, some kind of mapping of where um, the trees are, some way of demonstrating that you are um, uh, meeting buffering and site siting requirements. Um, you could also leave that to a staff review um, if you have trust in staff that they can uh, perform that level of analysis. Um, and you want to have uh, kind of a, a slightly smoother process um, while still having um, someone's eyes on a plan before it goes forward. I don't think the concerns here are as bad as or as dire as you make them out to be because it can be a little bit like a conservation easement where you have a the envelope around the house and then everything else is is pr preserved in some way um, like on Lang Road the the interesting thing is that there are people who really like living in that kind of setting where you have you can't see your neighbors and you don't talk to them very much. You don't hear them, especially if they don't have dogs that bark and things like that. Everything is pretty quiet and you're, I mean, when I was out there in Lang Road, I saw a barred owl. So it was, you know, people out there tend to like nature a little bit more. And the people who live on a place like Gunderman Road or something where it's one house after the other right along the road, those people tend to have the kids and they like to talk to their neighbors and, you know, maybe they'll have get togethers and have, uh, you know, dish to pass dinners or whatever with your neighbors and, and that sort of thing. So it's a different type of person or a person with different interests that that seeks these two different environments and you know it's I don't know I, I have mixed feelings about all of that <clears throat> all right um, yeah I, I'm not sure I subscribe quite as much as you to the kinds of that there's specific kinds of people who like each one, but there's definitely a variety. Um, and I think there, there really is a trade-off. Um, you know, you could take that same development on Lang Road and if you moved all the houses up to the, the street, you'd save a lot of impervious surface and you could have all forests behind them. Um, but there's that trade-off of what you, uh, what amount of privacy people want, what amount of, um, feeling they want on the street, which is a trade-off to the environmental impact of those increased driveways and the runoff that they're going to create and the materials that they use and um, all the ancillary uh, impacts of that. So, you know, just like everything here, it's a, it's a compromise. Yeah. Uh, David, uh, by the way, excellent presentation. I may have to drop off before we're done here. Um, I think that raises an interesting point, which is that, you know, people do want different kinds of housing choices, and I think a vibrant community gives people different types of choices. So uh, to the point Rhonda's making, you know, there might be some people who would love to live in the village, you know, within steps of the church and the town hall, others want to live further out. 
Um, the, uh, the thing that I, I wanted to raise is why I don't think it's necessarily something you need to calculate into each of these tools. Uh, there might be a value of having sort of an overview of what the social implications mm -hmm. of these land use decisions are. So for example, like in a conservation development, uh, you know, there's environmental land use implications, um, but there's also implications for people's contact with each other and, and engagement with each other. Uh, and community building. And um, so to sort of say, yes, in this type of situation it tends to engender more sort of social relations between folks and, and, and you know, what kind of society do we want here as, as part of that? Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, I think that's, that is definitely true. There's definitely impacts in the, the kind of development, um, the form of development of neighborhoods that we create and um, what comes out of that. Um, I think all kinds of development have a, have a variety of people who choose to live in them and those people have a variety of uh, feelings about the, the places that they live. So I wanna make sure that we're not saying that, you know, people who live in cities hate the environment or um, only people who, who wanna live on a hundred acres um, care about the land that they're on. Um, but there's, there's definitely are um, impacts from the way uh, we associate and design our communities um, from, a, from a social perspective. So I appreciate that. that. Um, the next uh, tool that I wanna talk about is conservation easements. Um, so with easements, uh, we've moved away from um, kind of the, the heavy hammer of zoning requirements and you know, limiting the, the development potential and into um, contracts that limit future development of a certain land, a, a parcel or part of a parcel or limit specific land use practices in a particular area. Um, easement, easements can be donated. Um, they can be negotiated for bonuses um, or being allowed to do things that wouldn't be otherwise allowed. Um, or easements can be purchased. They can be purchased by a nonprofit, they can be purchased by a municipality, um, they can be purchased by the state. Uh, they can be managed by the municipality or a private organization like a Finger Lakes Land Trust. Um, it's definitely uh, politically easier to allow conservation easements than to put restrictions on land use. Um, however, uh, if you're gonna have a purchase of easements program um, particularly one that is paid for with local tax dollars. Um, it can be difficult to find, um, to have funds for that. Um, purchasing a conservation easement has upfront costs as well as long-term costs for maintaining the easement, checking on it. Um, you know, there, there's legal costs down the line, uh, which is why uh, groups like the Finger Lakes Land Trust for a lot of their um, a lot of their easements to accept a donated easement, they frequently want an endowment to go with that to pay for some of those long-term costs. Um, one of the, the difficult things about having a municipality pay for easements is that um, you're using tax dollars up front and then you're probably also reducing the incoming tax dollars from that parcel down the line. Um, that doesn't mean it's impossible. There are municipalities who have decided you know, we're gonna have a levy every year. We're gonna create a fund. Um, we're gonna put our money where our mouth is and purchase easements on land using that fund. Um, maybe not every year, maybe uh, money goes into the fund every year and every five years you have enough to purchase a significant easement. Um, so that's definitely something that um, happens. Uh, I'd say that is a little more politically difficult, but it's certainly possible. Uh, the benefits of conservation easements, um, they're very flexible. You're not taking anything away from um, someone. They're uh, voluntary, which is very politically achievable. Um, the, uh, the town already has a process of um, pursuing and accepting easements um, and it can pair well with other strategies. So you can um, have land use tools that put restrictions on development and then um, you can offer flexibility in exchange for um, easements. Um, concerns, 
uh, relying on conservation easements alone for um, a reduction in development or, or long-term comprehensive land use planning um, doesn't really work out. They're kind of uh, one tool in the toolbox, but you need more than just um, the process of accepting easements, especially if you're only accepting them voluntarily. Um, especially at first, you're largely gonna get people donating land that they never would have developed anyway. Um, with mandatory easements or, or purchase easements, it can be a slightly more controversial process. Um, either you're imposing something on someone or, or you're using public dollars to purchase them, um, which makes, makes it all a little bit more difficult. Um, similar to conservation easements, uh, you can purchase development rights. Um, so there is a state purchase of development rights program. Um, or municipalities can have their own uh, PDR, Purchase of Development Rights programs. Um, you can raise funds uh, internally or from the state or from donors to buy development rights from landowners. Um, the way that works is there's an assessment of what the development rights are worth. Um, then uh, someone, the state, the municipality, a nonprofit pays um, what those development rights are worth. Um, and uh, then holds basically title to those development rights. Um, sometimes this selling development rights results in reduced taxes, not always. Sometimes um, the assessed value could stay the same or, or even go up if there's a market for properties um, with protected, that are protected from development in the future. Um, so it's not a guarantee um, the experience that I've had with um, the state's purchase of development rights program, um, they prioritize land. Uh, they're heavily focused on prime ag soils, which we don't have a lot of in the town of Bambi. Um, in my experience, uh, they've definitely protected a lot of land with that program, um, but I've also heard from a lot of landowners that I think were upset um, that the assessment of how much their development rights were worth um, wasn't what they thought it should be. Um, and you know the, uh, the evaluation process, the assessment process for how much development rights are worth is um, strong and comprehensive, but lots of times people have unrealistic expectations for what um, the amount of profit that they could gain from developing a property. So that can be a barrier. But these are still uh -huh. voluntary, right? So I mean, it's a matter you you, you can choose to sell your development rights. It's not like you're you're um, you're mandated to sell them for some reason. It's something of a competition to see who's going to be eligible and. Uh, you know. Yes, um, and you know one of the the drawbacks of that kind of scenario is um, you may not be preserving. I, I think with the states program, you know, they have a set of criteria that defines what is highest priority to them um, in order to preserve um, pro programs that are looser, that people just sign up to sell their development rights. Uh, you can end up um, buying development rights that might never have been used anyway, or are uh, lower quality um, land that has less value for preservation. So it's just something to look out for. Mm -hmm. um, the benefits, it's very flexible. You're not forcing anything on anyone. It's voluntary. Um, it can be paired with other strategies. Um, people generally consider this to be very fair that you're not, um, it doesn't have the impact of large landowners feeling like their value is being taken from them unfairly, um, which some of the other, uh, other methods um, that can be a concern. Uh, concerns, um, you're now stuck with tracking these development rights for the rest of history, um, which is a hard thing to calculate the cost of. Um, it can have limited impact, you know, over time, the impact certainly grows, but uh, this requires voluntary participation. It's not necessarily gonna protect all of the things that are most important to a community. Um, it will definitely protect some of them and it's definitely better to start sooner and do more. 
um, but it's not going to do everything. Um, and it can be expensive to buy those development rights on the municipality side and on the landowner side. Um, it's common to dispute the value of the rights and, and think that they're worth more. Um, with purchase of development rights programs, there's kind of a tipping point um, in, in the trajectory of uh, market value and demand for development in a community. As a rural community suburbanizes, um, you know, it's very cheap to buy development rights at the beginning of that trajectory and it gets more expensive over time. Um, it makes the most sense to do to buy up development rights sooner rather than later because those development rights are only going to get more expensive. Um, and most communities really commit to PDR uh, when they've kind of crossed a threshold where it's now significantly more expensive, um, but they also now have the political will to invest in um, that kind of purchase program. But uh, it's kind of the cat's out of the bag or the horse out of the, out of the gate or whatever metaphor you prefer there. But several uh, years ago, I talked to Scott Doyle for a, a, I mean, we were on the phone and it was a long conversation about development rights. And he, he seemed to think that the big problem was that there weren't towns, at least in Tompkins County, that were set up to buy development rights. So even if we had people in Danby who wanted to sell the, their rights, you know, nobody in Ithaca is set up to buy development rights. That's a perfect segue, Rhonda, to the next, um, the next mm -hmm. slide, which is uh, transfers of development rights. So generally purchase of development rights that by itself is a system set up where someone buys development rights who will never use them. The town buys development rights, a land trust buys development rights, the state buys development rights to prevent development. Um, in transfer of development rights, um, someone buys those development rights to use them somewhere else. Um, so in a transfer of development rights system, uh, a municipality, or it can be done at a regional level, though that's really hard in, a, um, in New York State because of home rule. Um, so a municipal, municipality creates a market for selling and using development rights. Generally, with transfer of development rights systems, you have a sending area. This is an area where you don't want development. So you want people in that area to sell their development rights. And then you have a receiving area um, an area where you want an increase in development. Um, so someone who wants to develop a parcel in the receiving area could buy the right to do additional development on that parcel from someone who has development rights in a sending area. Um, you could think about that broadly in the town of Danby as you know, letting someone in the low density zone sell development rights to someone in a hamlet to build more density um, with the caveat that in your receiving area, development has to be feasible to make it possible to use those development rights. So it has to be allowed by the zoning. Um, and then in our situation where we have limited infrastructure, um, you, you need to, I guess, build and be able to build enough density that you can afford your own infrastructure because there, there isn't a sewer system in place in the town. Um, so that, that can definitely be a barrier. Um, you don't necessarily have to have discrete sending and receiving areas. Um, you know, it, it is better to cluster development and cluster preservation. Uh, the larger and more contiguous a preserved area is, the more functional it is as a habitat. So even in a rural area, if you wanted to allow people to buy and transfer development rights, um, you know, you could develop one part of uh, a big parcel in LDR at, you know, double the density and then completely protect um, that amount of land in an, somewhere else um, if you are willing to accept that level of density. Uh, That's so. again, that addresses the point that Ted made earlier on. 
about adjoining properties and overall density. So essentially, yep. what you're doing is you've got the overall density is fixed, but you can transfer some of it to an, one from one property to another. Right. And I, ideally, you know, if we weren't a home rule state, the ideal way for this to work would be for people in Danby to be able to sell their development rights to a developer in College Town or downtown Ithaca. Yes, right. Um, the problem that's with, the, with this at all is that, that there has to be a receiving area that's desirable. Um, and we have the opposite problem, um, really, where at least in the rural communities, unlike downtown Ithaca, which is one of the areas where there actually is um, some some push to have higher density rather than lower density. Um, you know, the word from, from when we asked developers years ago, when, you know, why not invest in the hamlet uh, was that uh, because of the condition of the housing in the hamlet um, and there's nothing there, um, that is a less desirable area to invest in than in the greenfield development in the surrounding countryside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's definitely a barrier. And then, you know, if someone were to want to significantly invest, say they wanted to build, you know, an eight unit building in the core of the hamlet, it'd be very difficult because there's no sewer, you know, they'd have to fit septic somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's somewhat of a limited application of this possible. Um, in addition to, you know, you have to have the political will to allow that increased development wherever you send it. Yes. Which can be hard. Um, it's it's a great it's a very good idea I think it, there's a lot of environmental benefits but um, there in a rural context there's definitely some uh, difficulties so the benefits this is very flexible it's voluntary you're not forcing anything on anyone you can pair it with any of the other strategies um, the difficulties concerns you need significant development capacity in the receiving area you have to be able to build enough density to make this worthwhile. Um, and then you're going to have the same long-term tracking of where the development rights have been removed, um, where they end up getting used. Um, and you might want to limit the sending area to kind of priority areas that you want to conserve, maybe not have the sending area be the entire um, town. Is there any uh, TDR in Tompkins County anywhere? No, uh, I think people have been talking about it for probably 50 years, um, but mm -hmm. it hasn't happened anywhere. And it, I, I think it's, there are places that do intermunicipal agreements where you do transfer development rights from one municipality to another that generally comes with um, uh, tax benefit sharing. You know, you're basically uh, when you send development rights from one municipality to another, you're reducing the taxable value in one municipality to increase the taxable value in the other. Um, so frequently to make that work, you then have an agreement that say the city will share a certain amount of revenue back to uh, the rural town that's sending those development rights, um, which is a great system. It's a fantastic, uh, thoughtful way to do it. Uh, it's just really difficult. You've already said that it's not going to happen, but in the example you gave of transferring development rights from Danby to College Town, I think it was, um, is there any history on how the neighbors of the receiving site feel about this? I, I think that's that's one of the, the difficulties. You have to have a receiving site where they want the density. Uh, or at least they're willing to tolerate it in exchange for the regional benefit of protecting open space somewhere else. Well, I'm, I'm remembering a controversy in College Town when um, a, uh, I think it was, uh, well, for College Town, a high rise was being um, explored, or I think they went ahead some distance from Central College Town, and the neighbors were totally incensed that, you know, this big, you, do you remember the case? Well, there's so many. <laughs> and several, actually. <laughs> well, the, the failing there was that the, the rules allowed for that building to be built, but they had sort of neglected to say only if the high, very high density, high rise neighborhood has extended itself from the, from the center of College Town. You know, that you can't just build one big, big sucker in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, 
who do, I, I don't remember. It was it was on College Avenue. I don't yeah, the lower part of it. College Avenue ended up with some much, you know, fairly good, massive buildings in, in, with 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 and in between there and where the in the center of College Town where the other ones were, there's a bunch of single family or multifamily, you know, traditional houses with one or two, two, two and a half story buildings that yeah. look totally out of place once you build these um, seven or eight story buildings next to them. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the case. Anyway, just two cents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's all filling in in College Town. I don't know if you've driven through there recently, but sure is. Uh, massive yeah, changes. Town. That's a, don't you need like a passport to uh, go from Danby to College Town? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, they may have to take my card away. Um, all right, so. We've gotten through most of the kind of large scale zoning things, but there's some other considerations. Um, so doing these big uh, zoning changes, rewriting your zoning, uh, doing something like quadrupling the minimum lot size um, can be difficult to pass. It can take a long time. It can be difficult to protect politically. I think Joel mentioned in the past, sometimes you make a big change, you have the political will to do it at one point, but that in senses a group that then takes over power and throws it out immediately. Um, in fact, I, I think I mentioned in an email to someone recently, Randall Arendt, whose books I have recommended multiple times, has written about um, lots of instances where he was hired by a town to come in and make uh, a very progressive uh, conservation-focused zoning. Um, and if it was done without really broad um, community support, you can make really uh, significant changes, good changes that end up being thrown out two years later when the board changes um, and you can end up swinging in the pendulum back the other way. Um, so uh, that's not to say you shouldn't do those things when you have the ability to, uh, but it's important to build a broad coalition around them um, and to uh, really have the community behind it. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of small incremental changes that can have a, an impact quickly, even if it's small and that impact grows over time. Um, and I'm, I'm always an advocate for doing what you can today um, and doing more later um, because getting stuff done sooner rather than later means that it's having an impact over time. So some incremental steps, uh, a tree preservation ordinance. Uh, lots of communities have requirements that um, when you're going to develop on a parcel, you have to map uh, out the trees over a certain size. It's um, usually called the, the breast height diameter of the tree is usually what's used. Um, and uh, tree preservation ordinances generally um, either require the protection of trees or require any removed trees over a certain size to be replaced um, either on site or in, a, in another location. Actually, the city of Buffalo even has a tree preservation ordinance that requires any removed tree to be replaced and they allow it to be replaced um, in city parks if there isn't room on the lot um, to do that. Um, that kind of thinking can, can do some of what Rhonda was saying with you know, reducing the impact of, of larger lot kind of conventional development is if you tuck it into trees and, and protect most of those trees. Um, in addition to tree preservation, um, you can have wetland and stream buffer protections. Uh, the town of Ithaca has something like this. They have mapped setbacks and rules for two classes of streams, um, intermittent streams and uh, streams that are not intermittent, um, have different setbacks that they are required to maintain. Um, the town maps these out. You can uh, apply similar buffers to different kinds of ecological um, phenomenon that, that are worthy of um, specific protections. And you can do that without a kind of wholesale zoning change. Um, you can also, and I think this uh, process has been started, designate critical environmental areas um, using specific criteria, find areas that you're gonna require additional review or rules for during a subdivision or site plan review process. Um, is something that's mapped, it, it would be similar to an overlay zone. Um, in addition to those uh, 
I, I would say also with uh, with critical environmental areas, if you um, elevate a CAC to a conservation board, um, they're involved in that process of review um, and analysis of how development impacts critical environmental areas. Um, we can also enhance the way that Seeker is used by the town. So Seeker is a state environmental quality review law. Um, the town already has their own list of local type one actions. So type one actions are actions that always require additional environmental review. The state lays out specific criteria, but towns are allowed to um, have stricter rules. So I don't have any off the top of my head, but uh, let's say that the state called a hundred car parking lot a type one action. Um, the town could decide to call a 20 car parking lot a type one action. Um, so the, the town can have a stricter threshold for review than the, the state requirement. Um, in addition to that, using Seeker, uh, the town can do what's called cumulative impact analysis. Um, so generally when a project is reviewed, uh, the planning board or whatever approving body is looking at that, it's gonna look at just that project. What are the impacts of that project? So if you're looking at the subdivision of one parcel at a time, each individual parcel has a pretty small impact. Subdividing one two acre parcel off of 50 acres to put a single family house on doesn't have a lot of impact. But when you do that 20 times a year for 10 years, you do have a significant impact. Um, so the generic environmental impact analysis um, option is a way that a town can look at a particular part of the community <clears throat> and have a long range plan for that area, either a comprehensive plan or an area plan, and do an analysis of what change, uh, combined small changes over time, how they're gonna impact the community. Um, and then using cumulative impact analysis and a GEIS, you can set thresholds and mitigations um, for that larger build out. Um, so say, say you wanted to look at um, uh, that block on um, was it South Danby, South Danby Road, you can look at a corridor on South Danby Road, you could look at all the development that was allowed um, by existing zoning or by proposed new zoning, and do an environmental impact analysis on that build out, and then set thresholds for um, how much development would trigger a need for, say, uh, changes in the traffic pattern or uh, storm larger stormwater um, impacts that affect the community overall, uh, or uh, preser preserving additional space to make up for the impact to the character of the neighborhood of that development. And then you can require um, cost sharing for mitigations that are needed for that larger combined impact. So that everyone who comes along afterwards, um, if they want to do a development project, there is a formula for how they need to chip in for the, the mitigations, the benefits that are going to offset the negative impacts of that development. Um, it's, it's a more complicated process. Um, there is some benefit to um, developers down the road in that you've already analyzed the impact, so they, they wouldn't need to do a new environmental analysis as long as their development fit within the thresholds that were designated in the initial generic um, analysis. Um, so sometimes this is actually done to facilitate development, um, but it can also be done to help spread the cost of mitigating development um, when you're in a context like we have where you're gonna have lots of small projects over time. Um, so th those, those tools, I wanted to make sure that they were part of the conversation. And there's a lot of other, other things that we could talk about, and maybe we'll brainstorm some other things to consider. Um, that they're, they're a bit outside of zoning, and I think um, we're going to spend more time looking at zoning and looking at changes that the town wants to consider. Uh, but it's not the only tool in the toolbox, and there's kind of little things that we can do now um, rather than at the end of a big a rewrite of the zoning type process. Do these impact analyses tend to stand the test of time? Uh, that is, you, you know, years down the road after the analysis, 
they're used to justify something that is no longer appropriate? Um, I, guess, I guess I'm not quite quite following that. So with a generic environmental impact analysis, you kind of you describe the uh, development that you expect, um, and that kind of puts a bracket around it. So it's it's not it's not a great comparison, um, but it's it's one that I know about. The city of Ithaca did a generic environmental impact assessment for their big box corridor. When that was set up, when they kind of drained the swamp there and uh, wanted to unleash development, they did a GEIS for the Southwest area. Um, and in that, they put a box around it. They said, we're expecting this many square feet in total. Um, and then they did a traffic analysis with that, with that much new retail, you know, how many people are gonna drive there? How is that gonna impact the existing roads? The, um, they did other environmental analyses of, you know, the runoff it's going to create and those kinds of things. Um, and then they were able to, uh, I'm not sure if they did this, but they could then require um, multiple de different developers to pitch in money together to improve the stoplights on Route 13. Um, it, it also sets a limit. And actually, I think they've about reached that limit where once they get up to a certain number of square feet, that's the end of the analysis that they did. Their analysis only covers up to that point. So now they'll have to reopen environmental analysis um, for any subsequent projects that exceed the threshold that they, they built into those numbers. So obviously that's a very different type of development and analysis than uh, we would be looking at in the town of Danby, but it kind of illustrates that when you do a GEIS, you kind of set, uh, this is what we're expecting or testing against. Um, and anything outside of that requires reopening the environmental review process. Might this be used as a way to uh, facilitate development in say a Hamlet focused area? It can be. So um, it's frequent to do uh, a GEIS for say a form-based code for a Hamlet where you could do environmental review of a complete build-out uh, scenario of a hamlet at an increased density. Um, and then you wouldn't have to do uh, as much environmental review for each individual project along the way. Um, but it also allows you then to share costs. The, the town not only can require cost sharing of the mitigation, uh, the things that they decide are required for mitigation. So whether that's, um, you know, stormwater or traffic or, you know, changing patterns, um, increasing infrastructure. Um, they can also pass on the cost of actually doing the study uh, to the developers al along, the, along the way through a, you know, it's an investment upfront that pays back over time. David, uh, two questions. Um, one is, um, what do you see as the utility of, of sort of design scenarios like like the one they did for uh, was it at King Road and Danby Road? You know, yeah. the community getting on the front end and saying, "Look, look what would be could be here. If we'd like this." The second one is, um, what's your opinion on uh, you know if a community is sort of reluctant to sort of take these steps and they say things are fine here. Uh, what's the utility of uh, build-out scenarios to sort of, you know, smack them in the forehead with the two by four and show them what the community could look like if you really build out the way your zoning is is laid out? Yeah. Um, so, so you're you're looking at both sides of the coin of a, a build-out scenario of what we want, what we can have, something that inspires the community, and then the other option is a build-out of what's currently allowed, which is usually. Uh, something scary and frightening that we definitely don't want. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think both of those uh, certainly have a place. It's something that I, I have done for some other communities is uh, look at, you know, if we stay on the current course, um, what would certain parts of the town look like in 10, 20, 30 years? Um, which is, it's actually a little bit different than what you suggested, John, which is a 100% build out analysis. Generally in a rural place, you know, there's zero chance that any part of Danby is gonna be 100% built out, you know, even in the next 50 years probably. 
Um, but it, if you take the, the kind of trajectory that we're on, you know, 20 houses a year um, spread out mostly along road frontage, you know, we can, we can see what we would expect an average part of the NB to look like. Um, and that's something that I've done some of in Ulysses and some other, some other towns. And it, it can be illustrative because um, when you're thinking about zoning changes, um, we could go back to that slide of six things people hate change in the way things are. Um, it's easy to say, I don't like a new proposal. Uh, we have to always remember that what we're comparing it against is, is not neutral. Um, the current zoning, I think if most people said, you know, would you like the entire town of Danby to be built out in two acre lots or even five acre lots? The answer is probably no um, for most people. So um, I, I think that, that, that there, it's definitely useful to consider what you're, do you like the change that you're getting with your existing ordinance? Um, and then you also asked about uh, the use of doing um, a design scenario for, for a desired type of development. Um, and you mentioned the, the King Road and Danby Village that um, Form Ithaca, which I was a part of, um, designed Stream Collaborative and uh, brought in some outside consultants. I think that that can be very useful. I think it's more complicated in Danby because we have very fragmented land ownership. Um, on that King Road parcel, we were looking at, you know, parcels almost 100 acres owned by one person. So we could really look at what they could do. Um, you know, thinking about the central Danby Hamlet, it, it's more complicated on how you would achieve a build out there. Um, but I do think it would be um, useful to have kind of a shared vision of, of what that can look like and how it can work. Um, it, it's much more constrained. It's much more difficult of an exercise. And it also is a lot more frightening because you're proposing specific things on parcels that belong to one specific person. It's a little less generic, um, but I, I have seen it be useful. Well, and then I, that. I think it's worth mentioning how um, we have already uh, in the process of, in, in the Hamlet the development group, uh, then uh, looking at the interplay between where one might expand the hamlet and where the willing players might be to uh, to interact with, and we, we you know several have been identified already um, that that make it um, not so scary, I guess I guess you, you could say, but um, it, 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 it's, it's a realistic as well as a, as a theoretical exercise. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but it's worth mentioning that um, several years ago Ralph Pendle did the kind of uh, Build out analysis for Danby that you were alluding to. Hmm. I I haven't seen that. I love to, love to see that. It's in there. It's around someplace. <laughs> um. So I I think I'm gonna put up this list of things and um, open the conversation to um, thinking about which of these we'd like to talk more about in the future. Which do we want to learn more about? Um, while we're thinking about that, maybe anything that we should just uh, throw out that people feel like, oh, this, this doesn't make any sense for us um, or isn't appropriate for this town. That's me opening the floor. I'll, I'll start by saying I didn't see anything there that we might not be able to make some use of. But to be a, build, a much larger dialogue about, you know, how much use and where. I'm working on throwing up the list in case people have forgotten what the various options are. I'll, I'll talk through them while I'm pacing them here. Um, so we had large lot zoning. Uh, and, and chime in as I'm going through if you see something that you want to say something about. Um, large lot zoning, uh, use restrictive zoning, uh, number of subdivisions, limits, density averaging, sliding scale and area-based allocation zoning, conservation subdivision requirements, uh, floating overlay zones, um, buffer or other siting requirements for new development, 
conservation easements, um, purchase and transfer of development rights programs. And I don't see, I don't see much of a hope for, I'm afraid. Um, and then the, the other considerations were uh, tree preservation ordinance, um, wetland and stream buffer protection, uh, designating and protecting critical environmental areas, um, and then enhancing seeker environmental review um, with uh, addressing the type one action list. We could uh, maybe think about things that we would wanna increase the review of, um, and also doing cumulative impact analysis. So we have um, a working group that's focused specifically on conservation and um, some work has been done in there and you know where Jason left it off um, we were looking at um, an overlay zone that would take into account um, that was focused specifically on water primarily as a driver um, with riparian corridors and stream buffers um, including wetlands uh, and then maybe augmenting that with um, steep slopes uh, as a as a way of identifying areas that, that that wanted protection, but without getting into very much the mechanisms that you'd use or what kind of extra restrictions would be applied if it were created as an overlay. Um, so it it seems to me that you know that conservation working group is is where most of these mechanisms could be could be uh, reviewed and with an eye to how they might apply. Uh, the, the, the thrust of that group was twofold. One was to, to identify areas that are priority for conservation. Um, and that was a, an incompleted task. Um, and then the second part would have been in, in, in what way, um, how. Um, and what we found was that when we, when we polled the group on what, what it was about the town that they specifically liked and thought was worth conserving, um, if you added up what everybody um, had to say, it amounted to a um, consensus that we really didn't want much of Dan be developed at all because um, somebody likes something about just about everything. So that wasn't very helpful as far as um, helping to prioritize. So then, you know, from that rather general process that was not very um, focused, um, came the, the 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 last thing that we worked on, which was that possibility of doing an overlay and then, and, then, and then broadening it to include other kinds of overlays like maybe one for agriculture um, and maybe other areas. But anyway, that's, that's as far as we had gotten. And, and another approach that could have been taken, but, but what, um, what we hadn't done it yet was to look at the critical environmental area approach using the, uh, uh, the, the county's uh, unique natural areas as a, as a starting place in defining critical environmental areas and, and the additional um, restrictions that might be associated with them that might give them some degree of protection, which they don't currently have um, just as being designated UNAs. I would disagree with Joel on one point. I don't think that it was a bad thing that everybody found in looking at riparian habitat and wetlands that there were hardly any places that we should be building because we have an awful lot of creeks and streams. We have the ones that run north into Cayuga Lake and then we have all the ones that run south into the Susquehanna and we just and they're all running well pretty much north and south and creating all of these steep slopes. So it's just the nature of the geology or ge geographic area of the town. And so I don't think that was such a bad thing. It just meant that there were limited places for people to really be building. We're not a flat town. And like, like in, um, like in rural by design, everything seemed to be flat. I mean, we're not a flat town. And so we don't have a lot of places to be putting 
uh, houses, you don't want to put them in the creeks and you don't want to put them on the slopes and you don't want to put them on the hilltops where everybody can see them. So there are very few places for people to build and that's just the nature of the town. So I, I, um, I, I want you guys to be discerning and tell me that some of these ideas are stupid or <laughs> should be completely discarded or no one would ever really want to do that. Thank you, David, for this presentation. It was really very thorough. I feel like I learned way more than I thought I ever would know about land use tools. Um, I guess one just general observation was that it seems like the most sophisticated tools, i.e. like the best ones maybe, are also really complicated and hard to understand. And uh, there was actually one of them, I don't even think I understood it at all, even when you explained it. So. I think if any of those harder, more sophisticated tools are going to be used, I think it seems like it would have to be done in a way that's very strategic and um, specific and really well explained to whoever needs to be chiming in. Otherwise, um, it'll just get lost in translation. Yeah, that can be a, a real difficulty in the kind of political process of, of selling these ideas to a community. Um, it's really important that the town board understands uh, the ins and outs of it and are involved in, you know, designating each metric, um, but also that you really have a broad swath of people who are supportive of the idea and um, are involved in the creation of it. Um, I've definitely been involved with communities that spent a lot of time on some of these complicated processes and ended up throwing it out the window because <laughs> It was so complicated that it was really hard to sell to the people who needed to vote for it. This is Alyssa. I had a question along um, this very lines. Um, I mean, it seems like many of the tools are exciting, um, but it really would matter what sort of, of course, one could try to convince people of one's favorite tools, but it seems like it really matters what, what um, you know, the general public in Danby likes the idea of. And I was wondering maybe David, if you could speak briefly, I know you've said you have experience engaging the community, um, but what, what might be some tools to reach out? Like, I don't know, surveys or, you know, <laughs> pick your top three or how, how, how could you reach out to more people to find out what people love or hate? Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to, um, to have a survey about uh, sliding scale or area-based allocation zoning because you have to overcome that hump of what the heck even is this? How do I, how do I have an opinion about it when I, I can't understand where it's coming from? Um, and so I think it really starts with understanding the kind of base values that people are coming from at the level of the town. Do people, are people really committed to um, conserving land or, or protecting open space or um, wanting to reduce the amount of development that's allowed? Because that's a, it's a big step for a community to take. You are reducing the rights that people currently have. And so you have to go into that with a lot of, um, a lot of community backing, a lot of understanding of what the goal is, where you're going, um, and what it takes to achieve that. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, there, there's some really good things about working in such a small community. You know, most places that I've worked, the idea that someone would go and knock on people's doors to explain something is insane. Um, but in Danby, that's actually not that crazy. You could actually talk to a significant portion of the community um, during a year process uh, because there's just not as many people here as there are in a lot of places. Um, all of the community outreach conversations that I've had are really difficult now because of COVID. Yes. Um, and that's not going to be around forever and it definitely is convenient to be able to have this um, online type things where you can be in your kitchen or your living room and engaging without having to go somewhere at nine o'clock at night. Um, but a lot, most of the best ways of reaching people are going where they are rather than expecting them to show up somewhere that you're at. Um, well, the interesting thing is that 
back in, I think it was 1998, when the Dotsons were, the, that was a couple named Dotson who were very involved in in the town and um, they and a group of other people sent out a questionnaire and got a really good return from most of the people in the town asking all of these questions, lots of questions, you know, what did you want and what did you like and this and that. It got incorporated into one of the uh, comprehensive plans, one of the early comprehensive plans, and I still have a copy and I saw a copy in one of the comprehensive plans recently, so it's still around, um, of, of what people wanted and the vast majority of the people said they wanted to preserve the rural character of the town. Now that, you know, as we all know, keeps getting interpreted by the individual who says it, but still it's uh, it's a type of consensus almost that mm. you know people really want to preserve the rural aspects of the town and they don't want to see a lot of building and we've sort of decided for i mean at least a lot of people have decided we don't want a dollar store in danby and things like that so there there are certain things that we agree on and that's kind of yeah. nice <laughs> i think one of the things that's really important in when you go and ask the community something is that you are realistic in explaining the trade-offs. Um, so I've seen a lot of community surveys that say, you know, who thinks it's important that there is more free parking? Oh, everybody would like more free parking. Who wouldn't want more free parking? Um, but if you say, how many people would be willing to pay an extra eight thousand dollars per parking space for more free parking. You know, now you're explaining the trade-off that's involved in a decision. So similarly, with um, thinking about you know changing development rights in uh, Danby, you know, how many people are um, interested in you know giving up a significant portion of their right to subdivide and develop their parcel in exchange for the community protecting the environment and you know protecting this uh, rural character that's really the trade-off that we're that we're asking for and that you know is going to come at the end of this process um, there's always going to be people who are uh, motivated by that fear of you know i'm i'm losing something there's something being taken from me in exchange for something else and so we have to to weigh those values and understand what trade-offs is the community willing and interested in making. But I think it all depends on your approach. I mean, you can state it that way. It sounds very ominous to the person who has, who owns a lot of land. But then again, you could say, well, do you want trails? And people go, yeah, yeah, we need trails in Danby. Mm -hmm all of sure. this sort of thing do you want this and then people go yeah yeah that sounds really good and do you want to be able to do this yeah 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 sure so then you say okay now you have to <laughs> you have to commit to that yeah yeah it's a it's all a trade-off and i that's what, just what i think it's important to be clear about what the trade-offs that are being offered are what the costs are um, just like you know i've seen lots of open space plans that ask people who wants more parks? Oh golly, everyone wants more parks. There's nobody who doesn't want more parks. More parks are awesome. Um, but then when you ask who wants to have a levy to pay for to buy land to build a park and maintain it, you know, it's a different question. Um, and having having that full conversation is important because it's much easier to motivate people with fear, um, and it's very easy to have disinformation at the end of a process like this when people haven't been involved. Um, so making sure that uh, we're clear about what the trade-offs are and what the compromises are that we're making um, when making big decisions for the town um, so that people can say, yeah, I understand that, you know, this is the trade-off that we're getting and that is totally worth it to me. That is what I value and what um, I want to see happen. So I'm willing to make that trade-off. Um, 
I've seen that be much more effective than trying to hide the trade-off because you can't, you really can't hide it. It's, it's going to come out. Well, we had a really interesting discussion with Ted and um, Russ Nitschman talking about um, the large landowners and mm -hmm. how much it was costing them to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. And they were complaining that it was burdensome. And I, I think even for me who has relatively little land, and really depends on these large landowners for my my concept of rural character. I I said, yeah, I think you ought to have a a reduction in taxes, even if I have to pay more in taxes. So to me, it's worth it. And and I don't remember anybody complaining. Well, I don't want to reduct. I don't want to increase in my taxes. I mean, everybody seemed to understand that the taxes are going up and that if we're going to conserve the open spaces, that, and the, we have to help out the people who have the land. So, it, you know, at least the people who have been in this group seem to be fairly committed yeah. to the people who aren't in the group. But. Yeah, well, I think that's an excellent point. And I know that we are now five minutes past nine. Um, I want to make space for, as a lot of people haven't said anything yet, if you uh, have any comments you want to chime in before we break it off for the night, um, I'll, I'll leave it to Joel to decide when it's time to turn it off. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to break it off for the night before, um, so that you can just keep this in mind before we have a, a, at least a brief discussion about how to proceed from here. Well, I was going to suggest that the, uh, if in, in, in terms of the specifics of what you talked about, which was incredibly informative, uh, we could eliminate some of them. Uh, the purchase of development rights and transfer just sounds, I mean, it's a cool idea, but I just don't really see it being working in a town this size and at this stage, although I suppose the time to do it is sooner than later. But it would be such a huge sort of infrastructure thing to work out. And I do like the simpler things like the tree preservation buffer protection for streams and the critical areas uh, that they seem fairly straightforward that most people I would think would, would get behind them. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Toby. Other comments? I saw Claire giving you a big thumbs up there. Yeah, no, I like I liked Toby's suggestions. If there is one place where purchase of the development rights would be very satisfying, it was that uh, uh, the Dob Dobson estate. Except that isn't that in the hamlet that we want to develop? When you say maybe that would give us the right to develop it the way we want to. Uh, as yeah, opposed you're right. to I see. That's a good point. I'm not clear to what you're referring to. Are you were talking about the Dobson Park? Are you talking about the Dobson um, homestead on Updike Road or the Dobson estate, uh, the, the junkyard. The mountain. Oh Dobson. Yes, I, thought, I heard. I heard Dotson. Mm -hmm. I, I I thought about that. As I tried to be real careful, <laughs> mm -hmm. not yeah. Dotson Park or their homestead. Yes, mm -hmm. but Dobson. Yeah, that that's actually um, Ted. That makes me think of something, and I'm certainly not proposing this specifically for that parcel, but um, a way that a transfer of development rights system could be functional is if the town purchase and rezones land to be used for that development piecemeal in a lo location where they wanted. Um, so if, if there was a large parcel in one of the hamlets or adjacent to one of the hamlets that the town wanted to do a specific plan for, um, you could do that in coordination with a landowner or the town could own and manage the process. Um, 
<laughs> so assuming that there's the will to spend that much money. Yeah, that's a big assumption. Uh, but that's one way that I could see, you know, uh, development rights being transferred. You, you have to have a system set up for where it can go. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I think, a big barrier there. Um, any of the other things? No one said that they uh, would have a problem with having a large zone that doesn't allow any new housing or anything but agriculture or forestry or industry. I, I actually, I think the restrict the use restrictive zoning didn't sit well with me um, to say that a parcel can only be used agriculturally. It um, felt a little too uh, strict. Um, I liked also the the sort of more, I guess, aesthetic and conservation um, flavored uh, tools. Great presentation, by the way. I feel like I learned so much. <laughs> and I'm excited to be able to, to use these things in the planning board. Um, one thing that comes up there probably more frequently than anything else is the idea of um, buffering and, and siting uh, issues, which um, we've, you know, almost <laughs> almost every um, subdivision we talk about, there's a consideration of where a house might be and, um, you know, what sort of um, input are we allowed to, um, or restrictions are we allowed to place on um, where a house is situated. And so I think um, specifically that, you know, just that idea. I don't know exactly if the, um, if, if a floating overlay zone would, would sort of, you know, kind of balance that out if we need one or both or, you know, um, what, but I like the, the floating overlay zones better than the restrictive, use restrictive zoning. And, um, I'm definitely excited to sort of flush out the, the siting and buffer requirements, um, sort of tying into the tree preservation as well. I feel like a lot of that can kind of be grouped together. And um, if possible, it'd be great to have this sent to the planning board, <laughs> um, as well as the, the email with all the links, because yeah, this was a lot of information and I wish more of us were here me too. <laughs> and um, to David, this is Alyssa again. Um, I did also have uh, at least one person mention that they, you know, were sorry they missed it. Are you going to, um, I think Jamie sort of alluded to this, but were you going to post your presentation somewhere or can we post a link to the recording or? Yeah, I will um, post the presentation and the recording uh, on the planning group section of the town's webpage. But you could also put it in the Danby area news. Mm -hmm. sure. well, and I can also it. send out, yeah, I can send out a link to maybe to the people who missed, et cetera. I had um, just one other quick point that um, I was just looking at the list again and I remembered um, the, the large lot zoning does sound controversial, um, but we do have this sort of recurrent issue of flag lots. And so, um, the road frontage requirements, um, I thought that was interesting. So maybe, you know, um, I guess I'd be more interested in talking about road frontage rather than, mm. rather than um, just acreage in general. Yeah, that, that's actually something that I, I didn't mention um, because I know it has been, there has been concern about it. There are some, people who encourage flag lots as, you know, a way of hiding that density um, by shoving it back behind the existing rows of houses, you know, when you have a lot of street frontage development um, and then you have a big open space behind it, you can hide density by using flag lots. But it's, it's that kind of trade-off again of you have a much bigger environmental impact of all of the driveway to get there um, that you're getting for the kind of visual um, pleasure of not seeing as much of what's happening, but it's definitely still happening back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a house right behind me and I hate it. 
you know, I felt when they built it, I felt really that my privacy was being invaded because they were up on a rise. So they were looking down on me, right behind me and looking down on me. And I felt I had totally lost all my privacy. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put in the two cents that David. about restrictive zoning. Yeah. Um, it, Ted, can we can we let um, uh, Leslie? Sorry, Zisk. Um, weigh oh, in Leslie. Then, Leslie. Yeah. Leslie. Yeah. Oh, was that a raised hand? Sorry. I, I just um, also would would I, I liked the enhanced environmental review in addition to all those other 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 considerations. Mm -hmm. I mean. I, it, it sounds like and it would be a lot of work, but I think it might be worth worth looking into that with the, the cumulative impact, um, which is something that we've talked about at various times. Um, and just the town being able to consider having, having stricter thresh, thresholds um, than the state. I mean, I just, I, I kind of liked that. Yeah, um, and I, I will say that the town already has some. Um, mm -hmm. I know that mm -hmm. CJ, when she was the planner, helped get some um, stricter yeah. type one um, lists in there. And I think that's a great example of something that, you know, you just kind of do and it gets done and it makes a difference, um, but it's not a huge uh, controversy. I think that goes all the way back to Sue. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Anyone else? Ted, I know you had a comment. Uh, just, just to put in a two cents about restrictive zoning, we must not lose sight of the fact that, in effect, we have a very restrictive zoning in 25% of Danby already. And that's a large part of what the character of Danby is. It's called the Danby State Forest. Yep. Not muted. Are we not muted? Yeah. What, what do you mean, Ted? I don't really understand what you're implying. Well, if we didn't have the Danby State Forest, what would be in that other 25% of Danby then? It'd be so a... In effect, the state has, has, has done its version of zoning by owning, and they've restricted it to forest land. Yeah. Better really than easy. a prison, right? Yeah. Better than a prison. We could be beats Caroline. A, beats a lot of things. You know, remember that the town of Monroe up in the Adirondacks has three prisons in its town at three. Yeah. Well, anything else from uh, Bruce, Catherine, Kevy, Ke Kevin, Annette? I tend to agree with Alana about, um, you know, not favoring the restrictive types of zoning, particularly. I, I favor the, the, uh, a voluntary trade off of rights or purchase of rights or things like that makes more sense to me. Otherwise, I think you're going to get a fair bit of pushback, especially from the larger landowners. Thanks, Kevin. I'm, uh, I'm trying to process. There's a lot of information. Came like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, what what I what I sort of notice is that the so, and I'm not sure I can identify each tool accurately, but there's there there as experience on the planning board has told us that the areas that are denser, closer to Ithaca in the north, I think there's some of the tools that you mentioned were perfect for that. I think the areas farther out to Putrid Hollow and and much more rural areas have a need it need it need a different tool. Uh, you come over the hill here into uh, West Danby, it's a uh, you got there's so many restrictions restrictions uh, because of uh, the, just the geography and water land, wetlands and, uh, and that uh, <clears throat> there's not a lot of uh, a good space to, to to develop even when, when we're trying to promote uh, in, in, in the hamlet and uh, I may be the only one here that thinks that uh, trying to develop a hamlet on a major state highway is kind of a you know, kind of a Don Quixote thing that uh, uh, it, it would seem like if you really wanted to get density, if you really wanted to get the hammer, if you really wanted to get a walkable community feel, you got to get off the highway. But uh, but, but the iron systems of uh, 
of constantly trying to, to trying to create that that type of environment uh, around an already a big established thoroughfare. I think is, is I think has a huge impediment. Well, I I really appreciated your comment about um, using different tools for different parts of town. You know, the zoning right now is a very broad brush. The yes, exactly. particularly the the low density zone. For most of the town, you have some very different contexts, um, and it, it could be smart for the town to think about um, being more strategic and specific in how they address the, the different contexts that are in different parts of the town. Um, and it, just to, to push back on your comment about um, getting a walkable place along a state highway, um, the state highway that goes through Trumansburg gets as much traffic or more um, than the state highway that goes through town of Danby. So it, it can be done. It can be done. Um, it's not easy and having sewer sure helps a lot. Yeah and the, and the thing is that you're 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 dealing with uh, you know there's not an existing place where you you can augment it. Uh, yeah. you know, when, when you're going lot by lot uh, most people see proximity to the state highway as being a liability rather than an asset. And, and, and build back away from it. So you never you never really develop that kind of a cohesive core that would define a place. It's the, it's, uh, I, I always try to look at this from the, because I'm very immature, I try to look at this the way uh, if I was, how I was when I was a kid. What could I get on my bicycle? What could I go do? What could I, what could I do? You know, where was the sense of community? Where's the people? Have to, we don't have a school that we keep spreading things out. Uh, the, the, the lack of the, the lack of density uh, creates a different uh, kind of social environment. I almost uh, uh, worry about that uh, as much as I do, uh, you, know, you, know, you, you know, you know, preservation of the, of the, of the rural character. It's, a, it's the, the whole feel of, of, of community, you know, uh, that uh, it, 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 it's hard to recapture here. Yeah. yeah I was you know, just even even at your address more. is Ithaca, you know? Yeah. I was just looking at some old photos of when the Hamlet had a sidewalk. Yeah. All right. Any had, any other? Hamlet other had a sidewalk. <laughs> yeah. I, the picture was very early photograph, <laughs> early cameras. So it was quite a while ago. Hmm. Uh, so Joel, I think we've kind of prioritized some things to look at in terms of next steps. Um, yeah, the, the, I have more. Uh, my question now at this point is, is, a, is a process and, and procedure question of how do we go about doing that? Um, we we have these working groups. Um, are, are you suggesting, David, that we should ab abandon that structure? No. And, um, and deal with it, you know, as a group of the whole here, or um, or if not, then then um, then I think that 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 you know this should be passed on to. The, the conservation working group. Um, and I think that the, both of those working groups, the conservation group and the Hamlet development group, if you want to call it that, um, should be convened fairly shortly to, to uh, sort of take stock of what has been accomplished and, and where we go from here. Yeah, I think, I think that this definitely belongs um, in the conservation group's wheelhouse. Um, there's a very different set of tools that uh, you would want to look at for the, the Hamlet context and that that working group. Um, but I, I think it was it was good to convene the whole group and get kind of buy-in on things that should be moved forward. And now the committee can take um, this and combine it with the work that they've already done. Um, you know, I think that a lot of work has been uh, focused on the, the kind of streams and wetlands and um, the, some of the things that should be preserved and uh, we can take that and combine it with this and, and work on a proposal that could be brought back to the full group um, later on in the year. Okay. Um, so what is your feeling regarding um, between now and a month from now? Um, should we, should we, f should we leave the, uh, the Hamlet group on the back burner, so to speak, or um, and 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 do a similar presentation with options for for uh, encouraging Hamlet development next time as a focus for the whole group, um, or should we try to convene both of those working groups in the interim and um, sort of take stock and, and go from there? 
I don't know if anyone else has um, feelings on it. I, I'm not sure that we need um, to present something to this whole group before going to the Hamlet group. I think that that's a little more straightforward. Um, this whole, uh, the rural conservation part, I think is, is the hardest um, and the thing that we all need at all hands and all eyes on. Um, I, I think we could convene both groups this month. Um, now that I'm full time, um, for those of you that don't know, yesterday was my first full time day. <laughs> um, so we, I think that would that'd be great to make happen this month and uh, to come back with um, reports from the various committees next month. Okay, so we have an identified um, participation from, from the past in, in those groups, but we also have new people um, and people who might want to reevaluate what they want to be engaged in. So I think the invitation um, in, in, by way of doodle polls, probably one for each of those groups might be a good way to start um, to go with to everybody so that people can say where, where you know, can, can give their availability on for, for in each instance. And then we go from there. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's an exciting prospect to sort of ramp back up again with you uh, do in support of that whole effort. That sounds great. Uh, Claire, you have a question, comment? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I'd unmuted myself. Um, in, in terms of getting more people involved, I mean, I don't quite know who gets these messages. Um, there's something in the ch chat saying that Catherine doesn't, but um, uh, are, you go, are, you go, are we going to have something in the Danby area news that really reminds people of the planning group and what's going on um, and really encourages more people to participate because um, I think that's really important so that we don't do what David said, come up with a plan and nobody knows about it so they don't like it. I've been trying to keep people abreast. I think but... it's on the website, um, uh, the front, maybe the front page of the website and the news, we could put something. That would be good too. I mean, I don't know how many people go to the website. I do quite a lot, but um, yeah. but but everybody does get the Danby area news, and um, it doesn't get read. You know, I read it from cover to cover. I know not everybody does, but <laughs> maybe on the front page of the Danby area news in February. That's a great encourage, idea. Encourage Ted to give it more prominence instead of. <laughs> Um, I think we should use every tool at our disposal. Um, and I, I, I've been committed to try and keep people abreast in my, in my, in my monthly article. But I think you know David can and now that he's um, very much engaged can also um, do what Jason was doing, which is to give people other, other uh, information as well to encourage people to jump in. Yeah, thank you, David. This was really helpful. Yep. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Yes. And I think with that, we can adjourn. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, David. Good night. Thanks, David.